what's up everyone uh i am charlie shrem happy monday and this is untold stories where twice a week we dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to find out how this movement truly came to be usually we focus on past present and future leaders but today i'm i'm really honored to be here uh with a, with a true crypto og yanislav mahalahov thank you so much for coming on the show today Thank you, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here to yeah, have this opportunity. It's my pleasure because today we're, we're going to get to go back in time and talk about some cool historical stuff and stories. And as I've been going do, doing this show, um, I'm running out of like people that have been involved in crypto early on. You know, I just there's only a few hundred of them, you know, of, of us. So it's nice to talk to someone new. Uh, you were very involved. Uh, well, I should say that you're the co-founder and, and, and CEO of Eternity. And it's it's good to see that the project uh, is around and, and growing and and, uh, and and doing that. So, so yeah, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned Eternity. Eternity has been a wild ride. Um, yeah, we, we launched it from Liechtenstein in 2016. Um, it's a blockchain, by the way. It's a Turing complete smart contract platform, kind of new next generation um, Ethereum, one can say, or uh, yeah, a place where people can run smart contracts, can create coins. Yeah. So I want to like I want to get into that and and very quickly. So like the cool thing about what happens here is uh, is I'm bringing on uh, projects that have been around like 2016, 2017 that are still around today and growing and growing and doing crazy things. But because we're not in that like whole ICO world, people are not really, that news is not making it to the front. So it's so crazy when I release the show, they'll be like, oh, that project's still around. Like, it's good to see. It like makes everyone's heart sink to see these companies that were around early mm -hmm. on that are still doing around too. So, but jumping right into it, you mentioned, you mentioned something Turing complete. This is mm -hmm. something that when you uh, read about cryptocurrencies and you start reading some of the words of Vitalik, um, the founder of Ethereum and and one of the founders of Ethereum and a lot of uh, a lot of the other um, people who are involved in, in blockchains like yourself, this idea of like a Turing complete scripting language uh, is like touted as one of the 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 goals or the a scalable you know Turing complete uh, whole ecosystem. Can you mm -hmm. explain like what that means and why that is so important? Well, the Turing completeness or this term is from computer science. So it means that you have uh, the most powerful algorithms which can run on a blockchain in this case and execute whatever has been programmed into them for whatever value transfer or whatever smart contract one can imagine. Uh, Bitcoin, for example, has a, a kind of like limited smart contract language or scripting capabilities. You can do cool stuff with it. Uh, but uh, for certain things, for example, to program uh, uh, auction into the Bitcoin blockchain and let uh, people participate in auction, this is really not made for. So here you need state and you need uh, more powerful algorithms in order to... So what to defines like Turing complete? Is there, is there a certain amount of functions that you would need to have that, that this can do in order to be that? Right. Um, well, one is, for example, to have loops. Another one is to have uh, if or if and else clauses. And uh, yeah, another one is to have essentially statements and to, uh, if you have these three things, then uh, it's according to theoretical computer science, it's, uh, it's Turing complete. You can also think of it of a kind of like a machine with an infinite um, um, state or kind of like band where the algorithms crawl or crawl around and move things around. There are several ways how to think about these concepts. It's uh, the most powerful uh, uh, yeah, programming uh, category yeah. the computer scientists came up with. It's, so um, going back to those, to those early years, everyone who's involved in the industry today, in crypto today, they understand you know, DeFi, blockchains, uh, multi-signature, a lot of these bug buzzwords, the ability to have like decentralized finance and the a basic thing like having auctions built into a blockchain. Like you would think about it now when you're launching a blockchain, yeah, I would want to put that in. But when, when Bitcoin first launched and it was like those early years, let's just say like 2009 to 2012 or 13 or 2012-ish, 2013-ish, right? Those years, we were never really talking about being 
another a blockchain that can do all these things. I guess that conversation was was not really happening, at least in my circles. But from what I understand, in the circles that you were you were around, you started to talk to to some of the famous guys like JR, who was a founder of MasterCoin and and you started meeting Vitalik. And what people don't realize is that Vitalik actually was contracted. And I, I'd like to hear your you tell this story to oh. work on like a Turek complete Bitcoin-esque, like ver this was all pre-Ethereum. This was all like very experimentation. At what point do you think in in the early days of Bitcoin did that change? Did people say, hey, we think blockchains could do more than just what it's doing now? Yeah, well, um, you mentioned J.R. Willett, who wrote the second Bitcoin white paper, as he called it himself. I thought the title was a little bit uh, ridiculous, but he was onto something which really made sense to essentially be able uh, or make it possible for What year people. was this? This was in um, 13. Okay, so who was JR and why did he write this white paper? Like, kind of like, give us the, the landscape of what the world looked like back then in, in, in crypto. Or All Bitcoin. right, I mean, there, were, there was Bitcoin as the first cryptocurrency, famously, and there were a bunch of altcoins, um, like Peercoin, Namecoin, as the second cryptocurrency ever launched. As I think maybe it's not even the second, I've heard of another one, which is already, which doesn't exist anymore. And a few others, like, let's say that were like 10 to maybe five um Feather coins. and for every for every blockchain um people did essentially uh fork bitcoin um replace the name of the coin um with another coin let's call it uh fun coin and replace the logo and uh, tweaked here and there uh, a few things in the source code and launched a new blockchain and this was obviously quite of like a quite a overhead to to launch a new blockchain, uh, specifically also with proof of work every time. And uh, uh, JR, he thought of uh, uh, a way how to shoot coins on the Bitcoin blockchain without the need to essentially launch a new infrastructure, a new network. So to be kind of like on a higher level than um, the Bitcoin it's blockchain. It's the first layer two. I remember when MasterCoin and Colored Coins started to be talked about, uh, it was a huge deal. It was like the, mm -hmm. and I didn't. I remember. I didn't really understand why it was such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Someone said you're going to issue your own coins. I said, why would I issue my own coins? And I don't know if you remember. The biggest argument of the day was if you allow people to issue their own cryptocurrencies, it'll dilute Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. nowadays, that argument is is a stupid one. But back then, it was a real argument. Bitcoin was so new. Right, right, right. I mean, back then, the Bitcoin maximalists were even stronger than they are today. There was no maximalism because there was nothing really else to maximalize. Like, there was nothing else there. So it was kind of, like, weird to say. But yeah, I agree with that. It was very, like, very much so Bitcoin only back then. It was, like, a huge fervor. Mm -hmm. It was out of fear, though. And I was one of those people myself understand that you're talking about, like, our life and our legacy that was being threatened here because we didn't understand how this would affect Bitcoin. We didn't think the idea of crypto would ever exist. I didn't think that we'd have all these other coins and, and blockchains that would end up needing to be interoperable with each other and working together to do different things. Mm -hmm. very, looking back, I was extremely short-sighted, but, but so was everyone, right? Not, not making excuse for myself. Right, did, I mean- Did JR um... get pushback? Well, he had quite a, quite a lot of success. He collected a hell of Bitcoin, um, probably worth billions nowadays. Well, you don't know what exactly he did with those coins. But MasterCoin protocol, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, it still exists. I think Better mm -hmm. is still using it and a few others are still using it. But there are better ways or let's say more modern ways how to do this. I mean, the idea, for example, with Ethereum is to put also the um, smart contract state under the consensus of the network. While as with uh, with Mastercoin, the Bitcoin nodes don't know anything about the Mastercoin protocol. They don't need to know. It's it's kind of I mean it has some pros and some cons um, associated. Um, but Bitcoin it was the first time that uh, sorry with Ethereum it was essentially the first time that uh, one can have uh, updatable algorithms or smart contracts um, on the blockchain, and you can essentially program your own. Um, consensus rules into the uh, blockchain itself as smart contracts, which then are enforced by all the all the network. So every smart contract gets executed by every full node. 
And uh, but the word yeah. Ethereum wasn't really being spoken about then, right? Like the, that word. So what were what were your project names for this, and and who were some of the people involved? Uh, you mean like uh, the project um, before before Ethereum started, which mm -hmm. I was involved in? Uh, yeah, I wrote a blog post about this. Um, it's called the Godfather of Ethereum uh, post. I also uh, uh, copy and paste a piece of uh, history there, chat log between me and Vitalik, where I essentially suggested to have uh, updatable algorithms or kind of like smart contracts on on the uh, on the blockchain. We are not talking about the Bitcoin blockchain in this uh, case because Bitcoin blockchain has uh, quite a lot of transaction fees associated to it. We thought, I mean, in comparison to nowadays, it's, it was really, really cheap. But back then we thought we need something else. And yeah, we were thinking of doing this on Primecoin, which was another blockchain with a really innovative um, yeah. um, proof of work algorithm, which was not crunching hashes, but rather finding patterns in prime number constellations. And you wrote that in your blog post. You wrote that for the first time, proof of work was not focus on just minting coins and, and securing the network for the first time proof of work was being used for something else on prime coin. Right. And that, that is such a very pivotal, like psychological thing in the evolution of this industry, right. Of the ev evolution mm. of, uh, of this whole experiment that we have here, mm. which was like proof of work had a very specific role to play. And now that role is changing. And here we are all these years later, let me ask you a crazy question. Do you think that, we've like hit another pivotal uh, checkpoint in the evolution of this of this space with like ICO and DeFi worlds like, and I'm not talking about just how the world views us, but I'm talking about the actual scientific work that's being done on with blockchain technology and how it affects the world that we're gonna be living in in the next 10 years. Do you think that we're continuing to bring that evolution and growing that? Because some people, you know, they get lost in the noise and they ask me the same question. Well, I mean, if you ask me, I think uh, it's not moving fast enough, but I'm really working actively in the space. And yeah, people tend to overestimate uh, what can be done in a year or in a short amount of time and underestimate what can happen in 10 years. And I really believe that in 10 years from now, the world will really look in a different way. Um, it's uh, not just the currency aspect which is changing. It's really also about how the global society is uh, or gets organized or it makes decisions together. Um, I think uh, blockchains are super powerful also for, for example, having democratic elections on them with uh, liquid democracy or weighted delegated voting. Um, we have also implemented um, such concepts into eternity blockchain. Um, and... Um, I, I mean, so far we didn't really see the breakthrough of blockchain technology in the kind of like the real world, as some people call it. For me, blockchain is even more real than fiat, but most of people still live in this, let's say, um, old world. And it's just rapidly changing and it's like moving in waves and waves um, throughout the years um, with um, yeah, every time, I guess, the user base increasing by factor 10. And this is just my personal uh, opinion. But uh, we haven't seen mainstream adoption and uh, there's still so much room, so much room to innovate. Yeah, so many users to be onboarded. And um, it's uh, not just, the, let's say, the science, the math, the logic, which needs to be worked on, but also the usability and yes, uh, making really easy applications for, for the people. And it's uh, the, the cool thing here is that all, all the stack, all the software is open source with a, let's say, with a with a good blockchain, like Eternity blockchain, everything is open source. And um, we, we cannot know for what this blockchain will be used. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and um, yeah, we need to work with um, people all around the world um, on, the, on helping them to essentially solve their own issues which can be improved with blockchain uh, transaction technology and smart contracts and tokens and i think the world in the future will be way more liquid way more instant kind of like also more fair I like that. Uh, all the public things a lot I think more liquid world yeah that's very yeah. interesting quote to, for me to think about actually because that's uh -huh. uh, it'll help a lot of people when the world is more liquid mm -hmm. I mean, demands will be met in a much faster and more efficient way. I think there will be less bureaucracy 
and uh, yeah, we will be in a true global market. And I guess we will also at some point we'll reach some sort of global society or possibly a global democracy on blockchain technology. At least uh, this is what I'm hoping for. At least uh, I mean, I, I hope that this technology, this uh, wonderful technology, will not fall into the hands of let's say abusers or yeah. scammers. Um, there are many people who write the label blockchain onto things, uh, which... It doesn't really happen, though, as much as I thought. So, guys, I've been using the BitPay card since 2016, and I've been talking to you about it on the show for a while. And I got to tell you, this thing just keeps getting better and better. BitPay just launched an all-new MasterCard that instantly turns your crypto into dollars with zero conversion fees. You heard that right. Zero conversion fees. This card is also paired with the BitPay app that makes it really, really cool to have all the connections together. It lets you do things like buy gift cards with Bitcoin at over 100 major retailers or connect your Coinbase account to the BitPay wallet and to the card directly so you can load crypto onto the card with zero fees. It all works together instantly. And what's even cooler is this card now comes with a virtual version that's contactless and has improved security features that we all really, really need. Cool stuff, right? Well, guess what? As an Untold Stories listener, you will get a card absolutely free. All you have to do is download the latest BitPay app on your phone and use the promo code 10, the number 10, Charlie. So that's the number 10, Charlie. 10, Charlie. It works, right? To get your free card when you sign up. When you use that promo code in the BitPay app, you don't have to pay for it. So literally, you should be all on your phone right now getting this free card and be able to do all this cool shit and interact with the crypto and Bitcoin ecosystem. So remember, use the promo code, download the app, get your free card because that's why we're here to do amazing, cool things. I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Thank you, BitPay. I'm really excited when I get to talk about projects and companies that have been around since the early days of crypto and supporting those projects. In many parts of the world, banking services simply haven't advanced at the same rate as the adoptions of smartphones on the internet. Uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, it's they're skipping entire financial services over, they're skipping people over, and they're not even building out that infrastructure until cryptocurrency. We all know this, we've been hearing about it for so long. Electronium, a company based in the UK, decided to build an entire ecosystem based off of financial inclusion, empowering people, getting them involved, not just by working and by earning, but also by spending and being part of that community. Anytask.com is a company that's powered by Electronium, over half a million users, and you have the ability to do all these freelance projects, earn money, earn their tokens, and not only just earn ETN, but also be able to spend it on all these different things. What's what's crazy is that, and what's crazy good is that it's a, any task is attracting not just crypto people, but actual talented freelancers that are willing to take ETN in return for doing all this work. It, it's literally created this whole uh, ecosystem. And the thing is, it's not been just like a new novel idea. It's been around for a while. They're doing it. They're growing every single day. They're doing uh, millions of dollars in transactions. You got thousands and thousands of different people on the platform offering different services. And you should go check it out. It's it's so cool. The staff are great. The people are great. Everyone on the platform is so cool. Uh, according to ETN Everywhere, their official merchant directory, uh, ETN can be spent in over, I think it's 2,000 physical locations and online locations worldwide. You're talking about uh, in 140 countries, mobile airtime, um, shops, TVs, all these different things, not just being able to spend it. And so check them out, Electronium, anytasks.com support my sponsors they're so cool and i'm excited for you guys to check it out it, it, it's happening yeah but it's it's also getting better we're smart mm -hmm. the industry is really smart mm -hmm. what motivates you you know you you were involved very early in bitcoin and then you were mm -hmm. involved with 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 the early days of ethereum you know you were in the hacker houses with with all my friends anthony d'orio steve dack mihai gavin these are all people that were at my wedding like these are amazing people and then everyone went off to do their own thing and you started Eternity. And then three years later, here you are today. Like, I'm asking this question for myself too, but like, what's next? Like, where do you go from here? Personal development, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? What motivates me is, is definitely um, the, the opportunity to shape how 
uh, we, uh, the way how we're going to live in uh, the future, meaning to be actively involved in creation of the future, essentially. Um, I mean, it's uh, one thing to always criticize and uh, yeah, have some ideas. It's another thing to really build these things and make them um, available for people um, and then also usable and I mean, we still really need to see um, millions of people um, using um, or to, to start using um, blockchain technology. And um, I think this is one of our biggest, uh, most important things now to, to work on with the Trinity blockchain to have more usable consumer applications. And one of them is Superhero, superhero.com. It's a social platform on top of this rather, let's say, naked oh, crypto cool. platform called Eternity Blockchain, and we want to give the opportunity to people to give their crypto accounts, to give them faces and more identity and yeah, uh, network them and um, um, allow them to also use services, um, for example, also um, legal services um, where you were going to need some um, KYC or some documents. And we want to make this as simple as possible, as lean as possible for people to start um, using in a very playful way um, crypto coins to issue their crypto coins or crypto tokens and as well as launch their own blockchains after essentially having created a community for those coins. And um, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I would really like to see uh, an application installed on, on almost every phone. It should be open source. It's, yeah. it's kind of like anti-Facebook as well, um, meaning we, we don't collect data, we don't track data. Of course, the blockchain is a way how to timestamp data. Don't forget that uh, blockchains are kind of made for tracking. Lots of people think they're made for anonymous transactions, but uh, this uh, is maybe a flaw. Meaning it's an interesting point. Blockchains are made for tracking, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they're made for tracking double spends um, or making it impossible to do double spends um, while uh, tracking uh, the first uh, spend essentially and showing it to the rest of the network in a tamper-proof way. And um, yeah, with, with uh, crypto, you can, of course, um, um, I mean, you don't need to associate your um, identity or kind of like your government identity, but lots of services, uh, lots of companies, they are still or they are. But a lot of companies are doing, you, you just mentioned like AML and KYC, and that's great. Uh, a lot of companies are, you know, building that into the blockchains directly. Um, you know, you and I hung out with a lot of the same people early on, Amir Taki, uh, like uh, you mentioned in your blog post, am I selling? Were we in Vienna together at the same time? I was with Gavin and Gavin and Andreessen and, and, uh, and a bunch of other people. Amir was with me. The mycelium guys, but I don't remember. Uh, and the Bitstamp guys were there too. Maybe the I think the mycelium guys did two trips. Yeah, I went with uh, Vitalik to uh, visit the mycelium guys in their office. I think uh, like a, you were there a month before me. Um, here I met a uh, Bitcoin Milano. card. Did you go to Milano to this uh, old uh, butcher uh, management facility? <laughs> oh, the the uh, the uh, squatter house. Yeah, the first one. He, he, it's been like seven of them. I wasn't. I, I still remember seeing the first one, but I never got to see the really cool one that he was in because mm -hmm. I was under house arrest. But the really cool one where they did the the documentary there. They had the BBC there, or whatever. And he was like living in like a room upstairs. It was like a brick mm -hmm. castle that was just crazy stuff. How's he doing? We actually we we email every few months. He said he's working on something crazy, and he'll talk. Uh -huh. Come on the show when he can talk about it. But typical Amir, I won't hear from him for three years. Yeah, same here. Last time I saw him a year ago at the chaos, uh, not the chaos, at the HCP at the Parliament Palace, the Hackers Congress. Uh, but we didn't really get the opportunity to talk much. But uh, yeah, I, I, we were, we started the dark wallet back then. We started together. This uh, was yes. so. I think we started in this uh, house in Milan. Oh, you want to hear a crazy story? Uh -huh. uh, when you guys came up with Dark Wallet and Dark Market, this is so for those who don't know, Open Bazaar. So you had Silk Road, and then when when Ross went to jail, everyone said, "Well, the technology behind Silk Road is actually it's a good concept, a decentralized version of eBay." So now you have VC backed companies that are that are using the same open source technology like Open Bazaar. But originally, dude, I remember I was in house arrest in my parents' basement, and Amir showed up with I forgot her name, Julia or whatever, and um. 
he started pitching me dark market. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to jail in a few months. We can't, what are you mm-hmm. doing? It was just yeah. funny. And then, and then he left the house and then he uh, went to the train and then I got a call that he got arrested. I said, why did he just get arrested at the train? And I said, and they said, because he, he uh, didn't pay the ticket. He like jumped the fucking thing. And I said, he, $2, but it was the point. It was the point. It was, uh, Amir is that type of guy where it was the point of uh, rebellion of, of the status quo. And that's what really got him into Bitcoin early on too. Uh, and a lot of people into Bitcoin is like this rebellion against the status quo. Is that gone? Are there people like that still? What are they doing? How are they viewed? What are like the hacker and underground communities think of crypto nowadays? Do they think we've like sold out? Mm-hmm. Interesting question. I mean, I've met also lots of hackers, um, especially also in, in Germany at the Chaos Computer Club. They were really anti-Bitcoin. I remember going to the Chaos uh, Communication Congress in Hamburg uh, a couple of years ago. I guess this was 2013 or so. And they really didn't want to do anything with crypto, at least they're kind of like their their leaders. Uh, um, I mean, some people, some of the hackers, they believe in a strong state. It's really rather a, kind of like a philosophical uh, yeah. uh, uh, mindset. Uh, it's, it has nothing necessarily need, uh, to do with, with uh, hackers or with uh, software uh, producers, I think. Um, but um, I mean, the, the issues with the financial system uh, they are quite clear to lots of people, especially the ones who are digging deeper into the uh, economics. And uh, here also, let's say, hacking is not so useful. It's rather, let's say, the uh, economic studies and understanding that, for example, uh, fiat money is backed by nothing. Lots of people think that fiat money is backed still by gold, uh, like the euros or the, the dollars. It's not, not the case. I guess I don't need to tell this to the listeners here on the show. But um, um, it's uh, it's becoming more and more, let's say, accepted Bitcoin. It's when, when people talk about Bitcoin, it's not anymore. This association with the dark market is almost gone. People have almost forgotten it. Oh, that's all. Yeah, that's completely forgotten now. Yeah. I was back then. I was also not involved in the dark market, just in, and uh, in the dark wallet, which was, uh, I mean, my my uh, entry point to this was to have a super easy to use web wallet, like a browser wallet extension. And uh, unfortunately, the dark wallet um, really didn't get out of this uh, beta status, meaning it didn't um, get into the production ready status. Yeah. Uh, Steve Dark was actually the first one who created a, a Bitcoin browser wallet. And uh, this was a very interesting time crypto back then. Crypto kit, right? Crypto kit, exactly. Yeah, I remember. He, uh, him, and I stayed very close, which is very good. But you're bringing back like all these old memories now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been really good times, and um, I must say that back then it was almost almost more interesting. Meaning, um, the Bitcoin community and the crypto community was more close. Yes, I agree with that. I, I I agree with that. I do miss that. Mm-hmm. So I was traveling from Bitcoin friend to Bitcoin friend for quite a while across Europe. And then yeah, eventually came also to the Ethereum house in Miami, which was the first time I came to the, to the Americas. Uh, oh my, that was your first in, time and that's what you got to experience? Yes, quite an interesting welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I know Steve told me that like Vitalik would be pitching him Ethereum in the hot tub or whatever in that place. And, and you guys had the best time. I'm, I'm jealous. I wish I was there. Good times. Um, and I think, I think those times are still there. I'm, I'm excited about the future in terms of us all traveling again and going to conferences and being all together. When coronavirus hit and we all had to come and go back in our homes, our industry was used to it. We probably had a 0% unemployment rate just because we're bringing on more people than we're, than we're firing because we were all used to it, right? Did your world change at all besides for traveling? I mean, you're in a beautiful country, though, and you could travel. You can go around. Mm, yeah, I'm in the heart of Europe, so I'm, I'm traveling more with the car now. Um, I flew just twice this year, but it's... Uh, Are yeah, Europeans uh, doing cars or trains more now? Well, uh, more cars, to be honest. I mean, really? trains are rather empty, also the subways, and uh, people are 
still scared of the virus. I think it's getting better, but uh, yeah. It's like I mean, the Bitcoin charts. It's like slow. It goes up and down like that. <laughs> or out like that. Well, for those who don't see my hands moving, I produce this show in video and audio, so you can check it out on YouTube and Spotify. And I forgot to mention earlier, my producers are going to kill me, that the show is powered by Blockworks Group, a media production company that has over 20 podcasts in their networks, including mine and my friends' shows. So you're going to enjoy them. They're all great shows. Okay, sorry about that. Let's continue. <laughs> I love doing that. I'm, this is like a real radio show. I got like, take it seriously. There's no federal communications that I could see like, you know, curses and stuff like that. But the question I was going to ask you before I interrupted myself is what are you working on this week? Like, uh, this is one of my favorite questions. Like what this week are you working on? Yeah. The focus of this week is actually a secret project. Oh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a really cool project. Um, um, there will be an announcement very, very soon, and it involves uh, creation of a community in a physical space uh, with uh, the tokenization of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, due to the coronavirus, traveling became more and more difficult. So uh, now we are kind of like, or I'm kind of like looking into creating with, with superhero.com, with this network, which we have built creating networks of hubs of communities all around the world, uh, which also exchange ideas with each other. And uh, yeah, from, uh, I mean, all which also visit each other if this is possible. Yeah, and soon, it, right? Um, it's, uh, the situation is uh, really interesting here in Europe, meaning traveling is generally possible, but from time to time, these rules are just changing overnight. And some random numbers shown on TV influence too many people, I think. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I hope that this crisis will be over soon, but I think it will still probably go on for a while. Yeah. Um, and, um, I think uh, it's also opportunity for crypto, meaning um, having more private uh, things going on, private money. I mean, it's cryptocurrencies are the privatization of currencies away from the national states. And yeah, it's um, more and more people are also waking, awakening, uh, um, uh, waking up um, from essentially the um, influence of uh, mass media looking or kind of like inspecting uh, the, the numbers, the yeah. data, making their own conclusions and um, yeah, I'm, I'm building or we are building things and it's, it's, it's exciting. It's a very interesting time. And every crisis has also lots of opportunities. I especially think for cryptocurrencies, so for crypto people, even more opportunities than for, for regular other people. So if you're not in crypto, go into crypto, guys. <laughs> how can they, okay. So those who love crypto, how can they follow you? They like what you're hearing, you know, what's your Twitter and your blog? Yeah, my Twitter is N O Y Y Y Noi, very short, uh, just five characters. And my blog is on Medium. You can find me while you're looking for my name, Yanislav Malahov. And uh, we'll have superhero. it all in the show notes. And, and superhero.com, which is kind of like a social network. We also publish things. Um, and uh, Superhero.com. Perfect. Thank uh, you so much for taking the time today and coming on the show. Great. Thank you as well, Charlie. Uh, greetings to the States and uh, hope and we'll to see, see you soon. You.